This talk is a departure from other talks I've given in the past, so people who have uh, seen me speak may not be familiar with any of the terminology here, but we'll explain it as we go, and it'll be digestible and easy and, I hope, interesting. Um, I started looking into this because of my dad, and many of you know his story. In the um, mid to late 90s, he started developing heart failure. By 96, he had uh, dilated cardiomyopathy to the point where without heart transplant, he had about a six month uh, prognosis. And I had diagnosed him with Lyme, with negative blood tests, and he was treated successfully and never needed heart transplant. So it's my hope that somebody uh, sees this video eventually and it strikes a chord and uh, people become motivated to look into this topic. So this talk is about autophagy, and autophagy is a cellular clearance mechanism that we all have, and it's something that helps uh, our cells to survive. It's basically um, a mechanism of degrading and recycling cellular components uh, when the body is in stress, and it throws out the trash. So abnormal proteins that accumulate as part of either normal aging or abnormal aging, uh, proteins that are involved in neurodegenerative illnesses such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, frontotemporal, frontotemporal lobe dementia, those can actually be digested by autophagy. And organelles like mitochondria that are malfunctioning can also be digested by autophagy. So the body can get rid of the stuff that it doesn't need and kind of renew itself. It also has a dual purpose though because it serves to eradicate the cells from having intracellular infections. And in this way, autophagy can really either save the cell or doom the cell. Most of the times it saves the cell. That's what it really is. When There's a million variables involved, but when you uh, distill it all down, the majority effects of autophagy are for survival of the cell rather than in causing disease processes. So. It seems that uh, it's a real key player along a number of axes of disease states, and they've shown that impaired autophagy and mitophagy, again, which is the uh, digestion of abnormal mitochondria, has been demonstrated in a range of neurodegenerative illnesses. So these proteins, like I said, and these malfunctioning mitochondria accumulate in these disease states, and autophagy also is important in clearing out the cells and helping prevent the development of cancers. So it's a, a very good thing, obviously, but once cancers are already present, it can help those cancer cells survive just like it can help other cells survive. So it's kind of got a dual-edged sword a little bit. It can um, uh, stop cancers from starting, but once they're there, it can help them, help them live um, and autophagy is also central to the delayed aging that you see with caloric restriction. I don't know if anyone's heard that reducing your caloric consumption has been associated with uh, prolongation of life and health span among all the species that are tested. And the key to that is actually autophagy, which kind of makes sense to me because if you clear out the cells of the bad stuff, then they can live longer, happier lives. So in terms of autophagy and its role with infection, it's a critical part of the innate immune response to intracellular bacterial infections. And for many, if not most, of these intracellular bacterial infections, it helps control the infection. But some of them, the really old, weird ones that doctors don't understand, uh, take advantage of autophagy. They're so old, they've co-evolved with uh, us over the eons, and they've used what we would like to uh, use to get rid of them to their advantage. And examples of bacteria that take advantage of autophagy, unfortunately, are Brucella, Bartonella, and Coxiella. Lyme is unknown. So the take home point is that for many infections, autophagy induction can be beneficial. If you induce autophagy, you can help clear the body of infections, but some of them, it could be risky, particularly again, Coxiella, Bartonella, and Brucella. It's not known if you induce autophagy in conjunction with antibiotics, if you can help clear the infections. That's a big question mark. So now I'd like to introduce you to rapamycin. The other name of rapamycin is called Cyrillimus. So it's got two names. 
And it is a chemical that was discovered on Easter Island, and they named it after the people there, the Rapa Nui. And it was secreted by a type of bacteria called Streptomyces, and it's a soil bacteria. And the purpose of its secretion was to stop competing fungi from growing. So because it has antifungal you know, effects, it was researched initially as an antifungal, but then they found out it was a powerful immune suppressant. And as soon as they found that out, they totally switched gears and they approved it in, uh, the FDA approved it in 99, and now it's been sold as an immune suppressant for organ uh, transplant. So it's related to a couple of other drugs on the market called Temsirolimus and Everolimus, and it's not related to Tacrolimus, which is confusing. It's a completely different class of medicine, and Tacrolimus is more related to kind of like cyclosporin. So, you know, these drugs are kind of interesting drugs because most drugs, you can avoid side effects if you uh, use them at lower doses than the doses at which they cause side effects. But with these types of drugs, you have differential effects that at high doses, they cause one set of side effects, and at lower do doses, they don't just not cause those side effects, they cause the opposite of what they cause at high doses. And I'll elaborate on that. So now I'd like to introduce you to mTOR, which is called mammalian target of rapamycin. So this is an enzyme system that they've named after rapamycin. It was just discovered not too long ago. And they didn't know what was going on with it at first. Now they kind of figured out that these are really critical to uh, most of the cellular functions. And they are now known to be the master regulators of cell growth and longevity. And they integrate information regarding nutrients and growth factors in order to determine if the cell should be in an anabolic, so a growth phase, versus a catabolic, like a starvation phase. And they uh, kind of uh, reconcile those two so the cells can survive in the most efficient way. And this is present in all uh, plants, animals, and yeast on the planet. So when you see something, and I'm talking about target of rapamycin, that is so extremely conserved on an evolutionary basis, you have to take notice. You say, wait a second, there, this stuff is, uh, is present on almost all life on planet Earth. It's got to be very, very important. And if we could intervene in this process, we'd be able to make real differences on the state of aging and age-related conditions. So they have found that mTOR, again, mammalian target rapamycin, is involved in aging and neurodegeneration. And I'm quoting now from this article from 2015 that says that mTOR signaling pathway is involved in cellular senescence, which means aging of the cells, organismal aging, so aging of the entire animal, and age-dependent diseases. And they're saying that disturbance in mTOR signaling in the brain affects multiple pathways, key players in age-related cognitive decline, such as the development of Alzheimer's disease. So others have been researching the relationship of mTOR to Alzheimer's. And they've shown that um, there's a relationship between di type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's. And that relationship uh, hinges on mTOR. So again, I'm quoting from this next article. And it says here that uh, high sugar consumption and diabetes increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's. And in an animal model of Alzheimer's, they showed that sucrose intake induced obesity amyloid beta production, and tau phosphorylation. Amyloid beta and tau are two of these abnormal proteins that accumulate in Alzheimer's. And they've shown that um, this sucrose-mediated increase in Alzheimer's-like pathology is precisely due to hyperactive mTOR. So mTOR is uh, you know, very good for us and very bad for us at the same time. And it's interesting we would have something like that in our bodies. They've also shown that rapamycin, an mTOR inhibitor, prevents the detrimental effects of sucrose in the brain without altering changes in peripheral insulin resistance. And that they've shown through uh, animal models. So I said just a second ago that it's very good for us and very bad for us. You know, why do we have mTOR? If we didn't have mTOR, we couldn't grow up. We couldn't grow from being a fetus to a baby and then to an adolescent, and we just would never grow. But once you're full grown, and once you have reached uh, reproductive age, evolution kind of turns its back on us, and mTOR doesn't stop. So uh, it kind of uh, 
keeps driving growth in this kind of useless manner and it literally drives us to grow old. And the term growing old is more accurate, I think, than people realize because mTOR converts reversible cellular arrest to senescence. And that means reversible cellular arrest is when the cells, you know, they, they can't uh, divide anymore because of, they're called um, either genetic or epigenetic uh, problems. You know, you ever hear of telomerase, telomeres, when the telomeres start to shorten and they genetically become unstable, mTOR is still driving replication, it's still driving growth. And so what it does, it drives them to become the senescent phenotype. And that means that the cells turn into an aged type of cell. Those cells don't function properly. They all of a sudden become inflammatory and kind of bloated. And that is what you see in, in old folks, the type of cells uh, on biopsies. So in this other study that I'm referencing, because there are three studies on this page, mTOR is a central pathway to aging, obesity, cancer, and autoimmune disorders. And, but the thing is, all of those are linked together, and you don't know which came first. Is it the chicken or the egg? They have done other studies where they isolated the variables and found that mTOR, in isolation, if you stimulate it, it's sufficient to promote cancer. So, which should come as no surprise that mTOR inhibitors are useful as non-cytotoxic anti-cancer medications. So non-cytotoxic means that they're not like chemotherapy. They don't kill cells directly. They don't kill cancer cells. But rapamycin slash sirolimus is the same drug. And its derivatives are useful against a range of human cancers. And derivatives of rapamycin, which are tem sirolimus and everolimus, are actually FDA approved for the treatment of breast and renal cancer, respectively. And, but it all comes back to rapamycin. This drug is generic, it's cheap, and it's been around for a long time, and it is the kind of, you know, archetypal mTOR inhibitor. So it rapidly and powerfully inhibits mTOR1, and it does not affect mTOR2 with short-term exposure. mTOR1 and 2, it's two different enzyme systems that are linked, and if you inhibit mTOR2, you can get some side effects, and the side effects primarily are like a, um, a diabetes-like condition, it doesn't seem to have uh, the, um, all the bad stuff that regular diabetes is associated with, but it's a, a diabetes, or more of a benign version of a diabetes-like condition. But with intermittent or short-term exposure to rapamycin, that doesn't occur. It's only with chronic kind of long-term exposure. And by inhibiting mTOR1, you powerfully induce autophagy in a number of studies. So I wanted to examine a theory that autophagy and mTOR inhibition could be useful to intervene for age-related neurodegenerative disorders. And in doing that, I didn't want to just concentrate on rapamycin, even though that's the classic mTOR inhibitor. I had to say if this theory would hold water, it would have to hold water across multiple domains. And so I looked at other mTOR inhibitors and looked for data. And it all seems to line up. So I'm listing on this slide uh, other um, uh, autophagy inducers. Some of them are mTOR dependent and some are independent. And if we just go down the list, some you've, I'm sure you've heard of, others maybe not so much. Uh, vitamin D is actually an autophagy inducer that is mTOR dependent. Metformin, which is a type 2 diabetes drug. Most of the tetracycline class antibiotics are. There are some limited data that minocycline can sometimes prevent autophagy from occurring, but by and large, they're autophagy inducers. Curcumin, which is a spice that's in curry. Uh, EGCG, which is the green tea extract. And that has mixed mTOR-dependent and mTOR-independent autophagy induction. And calorie restriction. Again, the, the stuff that they publish in so many studies that extends life and health span is dependent upon autophagy and mTOR. So, uh, an exercise actually in the brain will induce autophagy and inhibit mTOR, but the opposite is true in skeletal muscle. It'll actually uh, uh, stimulate mTOR and turn off autophagy. So it has this kind of uh, opposing effects. And then the mTOR independent ones I've listed here on this slide are trehalose, which is a type of sugar, and carbamazepine and valproic acid, which are both, both uh, anti-seizure medications. 
and lithium, which is a mood stabilizer for bipolar disease. And lithium is tricky though because it also stimulates mTOR. It induces autophagy and in an mTOR independent way and then stimulates mTOR, which would then have a feedback loop and reduce autophagy. So that's useful if you give it with an mTOR inhibitor. So most of the uh, uh, folks that I've spoken to recently about this, I only gave this talk once before at ILADS, and it's a room full of doctors, and everybody's familiar with everything that I mentioned, but you guys maybe not so much. But the next slide explains tree halos, because most doctors aren't familiar with that. And tree halos is a sugar that is present in many forms of life, but not in mammals. And it's composed of gl two glucose units, and we just don't use it. But it's found in lots of foods, especially mushrooms. It's called mushroom sugar. And it's an approved food additive. It's available in the U.S. It's really cheap. But when you eat it, it's largely metabolized by enzymes in the intestine to glucose. But some of it gets absorbed orally. And it's, um, the next study I'm referencing here is a, uh, a uh, summary of eight different safety studies on tree halos. And they say it's safe for human consumption. And then in this study at the bottom of the slide, they've shown that high-dose intravenous tree halos is safe in humans as well. And that is actually being studied as one of uh, their lead drugs by a biotech company to reverse a couple of genetic neurodegenerative disorders. So other people are thinking along these lines. And, uh, and it is comforting to know that a large dose of, a dose of intravenous tree halos is safe uh, they haven't come out with the uh, efficacy reports from that study yet, but just the safety reports and they've made public. So, you know, what if you have chronic central, nervous, chronic central nervous system infections, inflammation, insulin, bad diet? What is the relationship between all these things? Unfortunately, in some folks with or without susceptible genetics, they will accumulate abnormal proteins and will present in the following three groups of neurodegenerative illness. And those groups are Alzheimer's, where the culprit protein is beta amyloid. And then they have the synucleinopathies, which the protein is alpha synuclein. And those consist of Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body dementia, and multiple system atrophy. And then you have a uh, spectrum disease of ALS and frontotemporal lobe dementia, which are actually related. And that's only recently been uh, discovered. And that protein is TDP43. So they're called the TDP43 proteinopathies. And uh, in the next slide, we talk about the ALS and frontotemporal lobe dementia spectrum with involving TDP43. And it shows that um, <coughs> Aggregated proteins, I'm quoting from this study, are a key feature of the pathology of all the major neurodegenerative diseases. ALS was brought into this fold quite recently with the discovery of TDP43 inclusions in nearly all ALS cases. And that this discovery was fueled by the recognition of the clinical overlap between ALS and frontotemporal lobe uh, degeneration where TDP43 inclusions were first identified. So in the next uh, study referenced here, they did an autopsy of 64 patients with frontotemporal lobe dementia with or without motor neuron disease and ALS patients with or without cognitive impairment and found this TDP43 in everybody. So this seems to be the predominant player uh, that's involved in ALS and frontotemporal lobe dementia. So with Alzheimer's, there have been links to infection and inflammation for a very long time. I'm presenting four studies on this slide. The first just says that neuroinflammation plays a critical role in Alzheimer's. The second is Alan McDonald's studies dating from back to 1987, where he was able to culture Borrelia spirochetes from the autopsy of brain tissue from patients with Alzheimer's. In the next study, I talk about amyloid metabolism being altered with central nervous system Lyme disease. And in the, the fourth study here, and I quote, it says, spirochetes contain amyloidogenic proteins. So, so there are proteins on the surface of spirochetes that induce the production of amyloid by our bodies. And with Parkinson's, they also show that central nervous system inflammation is an important contributor to the pathogenesis of the disease. Again, there's four studies on this slide. And they've demonstrated Parkinsonism in brucellosis. The only difference between Parkinsonism and Parkinson's is when they find out the cause of Parkinsonism 
no, find out what the cause of Parkinson's, then they call it Parkinsonism. So it's like Parkinsonism due to Lyme, Parkinsonism due to brucellosis, due to Bartonella. And I present three different studies where they found Parkinsonism due to brucellosis, Bartonella, and Lyme. So we know that multiple infections can cause Parkinsonism, and if those infections are not diagnosed, those people will be defaulted to a Parkinson's diagnosis. Uh, and it's the same. Uh, the next slide looks at ALS and motor neuron disease in general, and they've shown that inflammation is a critical part of uh, ALS. And there was a study dating back from 1990 where they took people that had typical ALS and none of them had typical Lyme and demonstrated that the antibody tests for Lyme disease were five times more common in the ALS group than the control group. And they showed that a subset responded to antibiotic therapy. And then the next uh, study is Lyme was initially diagnosed as ALS and did respond to antibiotics and the person got better and then the ALS diagnosis was changed. And then they've also demonstrated motor neuron disease and brucellosis and that was the next slide on that table. So because of the suspicion of infection in these illnesses they have done a few, very limited, but a few uh, randomized placebo controlled trials in neurodegenerative disorders. They did one with doxycycline and rifampin versus placebo uh, for three months, and they showed less decline in the treatment arm in ALS patients, excuse me, Alzheimer's patients, and that was published in 2004. But then when they repeated uh, this study in 2013 for 12 months, there was no significant benefits to the treatment arm. So you're getting kind of small benefits and contradictory results. And they've done studies of minocycline for multiple system atrophy Parkinson's type with a randomized placebo controlled trial. And they did show less inflammation in the brain, but there was no significant difference in the rate of functional decline. They did a study also on this, on this slide here, uh, minocycline versus creatine versus placebo for early Parkinson's and didn't show any change in the need for starting symptomatic treatments. So again, not much of a benefit. And here they did a study of ALS where they randomized ceftriaxone for 20 weeks and there was a large study, it was 340 patients and there was no significant difference in the rate of functional decline. So this is my um, slide where I reference the Big Bang Theory. Got amyloid beta or beta amyloid alpha-synuclein or TDP43, now what? Because you may be feeling frustrated and hopeless, and Leonard says, what would you be if you were attached to another object by an inclined plane wrapped helically around an axis? And Sheldon says, screwed. And I would say that that's an appropriate feeling. You know, you may feel screwed. But screws would be made to be unscrewed, and uh, I think where well, there's life, there's hope. And for me, it all came back to autophagy, which is like a Rosetta Stone. And, and then here on this slide, I present multiple studies that autophagy can digest misfolded and aggregated proteins across a range of neurodegenerative illnesses. And um, mitophagy can digest damaged uh, mitochondria. So the next slides uh, deal with a lot of animal studies of uh, rapamycin to see if they can show benefits to Alzheimer's models. And here's two slides showing that it reverses Alzheimer's in the animal models of Alzheimer's, that rapamycin rescues the deficits, the animals behave normally. And here's a couple more slides, same thing, animal models for Alzheimer's showing the rapamycin reverses the changes. In the first study, um, the established changes uh, had no effects and only worked to prevent the changes. In the second study, it actually reversed the changes such that the Alzheimer's mice uh, behave normally after rapamycin treatment. They couldn't tell the difference between the ones that were, had Alzheimer's and the ones that didn't. But um, when you look at large-scale uh, studies of Alzheimer's, you find that it's very low in rural India. It's among the lowest in the world. And they've linked it to uh, the consumption of curry and the spice in curry, curcumin, or turmeric. And curcumin is the active component. And when they give uh, curry curcumin basically to uh, the Alzheimer's mouse model, it reduces the plaque burden by 43 to 50 percent, which is huge. But it only works for low-dose curcumin, low-dose uh, 
uh, yeah, low dose curcumin, and not high dose. So there's so many variables here. It's like a twisted web uh, that someone had kind of made. It's impossible to follow all the variables, but you find this a lot throughout a lot of my slides here. We'll talk about, you know, dose relationships with efficacy. And why would a high dose not work, but a low dose would work? I mean, curcumin is an adaptogen. It kind of has a mix of antioxidant and pro-oxidant qualities. And oxidation is not great. It's bad for us and sometimes, but antioxidants don't work well. They're pure antioxidants. You need a mix. And there's, it's very hard to find this kind of balance between them. So because of that, the limited studies on curcumin in uh, you know randomized controlled trials and even case reports, they're hard to rely on. I'm presenting two case two studies here. One is only 34 patients, and they got randomized to one gram or four grams or zero grams of turmeric for six months. They found no changes in the mini mental status exam scores. And then the next study is a case series of three patients who took turmeric for one year at a lower dose, and they all got benefits. So. One out of three of them had a five-point increase in many mental status exam scores. You say, is that significant, five points? Actually, it is. Three points is considered significant, and that's what the Aricept-type drugs usually do, three points. And two out of the three people had scores so low, the scores go up to 30, and they had one had a zero, and one had a one. These are very, very severe dementia patients who didn't recognize uh, their family and couldn't participate in any aspects of normal life. And they began to recognize their family. And they, they, if you read the case reports, they were laughing at the television shows with their family, and they weren't running out of the house in the middle of the night. You know, it's just, of course, they weren't normal, but something that's very, very safe, like uh, turmeric, was, was helping. So then you say, OK, well, let's look at larger numbers. How many times have they done big studies? It's very, very few. You will find very few studies that are of significant power on medications that are cheap and readily available. And I'm sorry to say that that's the case most of the time because there's not uh, big money to be made by pharmaceutical companies. But in this study, they did look at uh, 1,010 non-demented participants and compared the folks who never or rarely consumed curry with the people who did consume curry on, uh, you know, either occasionally or frequently, and they found very uh, statistically significant changes in many mental status exam scores. So even in non-demented normal people, what's normal then? You know, is there such a thing as normal? So uh, the folks who ate curry did better. And then we look at uh, green tea extract and exercise. And they have shown that both green tea extract and exercise separately and in combination, this is an animal study of the um, mouse model of Alzheimer's, it uh, helped their cognitive performance on their maze testing and everything else. And it showed that they had lower levels of uh, beta amyloid in their brains. And again, cheap, readily available substances without uh, a ton of data behind them. And then if you look at carbamazepine, that's the um, anti-seizure medicine that I had referenced in that list. Uh, after three months of treatment with carbamazepine in an Alzheimer's mouse model, I'm quoting now, we demonstrated that the spatial learning and memory deficits of these mice are significantly alleviated. We also documented that the cerebral amyloid plaque burden in these mice are significantly reduced. So. I'm struck by the fact when I started looking into this that all these autophagy inducers show benefits across many domains. Right now I'm just uh, looking at Alzheimer's. If we uh, went through all the diseases and all the different axes of how you know, autophagy inducers can help people, this would be a very, very long talk. But trust me when I tell you I have gone through them and for hours and hours and hours and the day is like holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. So uh, here I'm talking about Alzheimer's and tree halos. And there's a couple of studies on this slide. It says here that the effects of tree halos in the Alzheimer's mouse model showed that impaired cognitive and learning ability was improved. And then again, that beta amyloid deposits in the hippocampus, which is part of the brain, was reduced. And in uh, the next study from 2013, they said that in neurons, tree halos induced autophagy, reduced tau aggregation and eliminated cytotoxicity. It means that it eliminated the, um, the toxicity to the nerve cells. It also inhibited the tau from congregating and aggregating abnormally in a direct fashion. 
And the author's conclusions, I'm quoting, tree halos may be a good candidate for developing therapeutic strategies for Alzheimer's and other tauopathies. And then I've uh, evaluated Alzheimer's here with vitamin D. Because uh, vitamin D, and there's three, uh, four studies on this page, and vitamin D stimulates the clearance of amyloid plaques by macrophages and reduces amyloid toxicity in cortical neurons. And they've shown that, again, in nerve culture studies, that vitamin D is effective on its own and additively with curcuminoids, which are like turmeric, curcumin type things, to enhance the clearance of beta amyloid. And that vitamin D enhances the clearance of beta amyloid across the blood-brain barrier in the mouse model and reduces amyloid plaques. And those are two studies there. And they said, okay, vitamin D is easy and cheap. Why don't we do a study with Alzheimer's? Limited data. So vitamin D plus memantine, which is namenda, it's a type of medicine used for memory impairment that is a different mechanism of action from Aricept. And that was associated with an improvement in mini mental status exam scores of six months. But here they showed that single agent memantine or vitamin D was not associated with improvement. And then they did a randomized controlled trial of high dose vitamin D for eight weeks and there was no benefit. But this study, in my opinion, is flawed. And number one, it was only for eight weeks. Number two, they used a high dose. Again, there's a dose response curve with many of these agents. And the next few slides go over the dose response curves with vitamin D. It's a completely nonlinear U-shaped response across everything. And the first study, I have, I'll quote here, that participants with both low and high vitamin D concentrations, low meaning be below 25 and high meaning above 75, at age 45 years old, perform significantly worse on immediate word recall. So the take home message is that low vitamin D will impair cognition and high vitamin D will impair cognition. And the next study they show that toddlers with the lowest quintile of cord blood vitamin D exhibited deficits and the toddlers with the highest quintile of cord blood vitamin D also had significant developmental deficits. And in larger prospective observational studies, they also find a U-shaped association with vitamin D and cardiovascular health. It shows up in so many domains of health, it's kind of ridiculous. The next, there are three studies on this slide. The next one shows that uh, in kids 6 to 12, there was a, I'm quoting from the article here, a U-shaped association with vitamin D levels and respiratory health. And they've even looked at it with cancer as well and show that both low and high vitamin D is associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. And then they did a uh, summary from 10 prospective studies uh, where they included 2,227 lung cancer events and found, I'm quoting, an evidence of a nonlinear relationship between vitamin D and the risk of lung cancer with the greatest reduction at risk at nearly 53. So 53 is a very nice level of vitamin D to be at, just for the general population on so many levels. So, so we'll switch away from uh, Alzheimer's for a moment and so we'll look at synucleinopathies, okay? So synucleinopathies is that uh, those three major classes, again, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, multiple system atrophy. And so they're saying here in this study that because rapamycin stimulates autophagy and increases the clearance of alpha-synuclein, that it merits consideration as a potential therapeutic effect, uh, therapeutic for Parkinson's. This is the theories going back since 2003. And then in 2015, they showed that uh, rapamycin restores mitochondrial dysfunction and gets rid of the neurodegenerative features in a rodent model of Parkinson's. And in other mouse models of uh, Parkinson's, they show that rapamycin, I'm quoting now, is able to prevent the loss of the Th positive and, and I put in parentheses here to explain for you guys that TH positive means uh, tyrosine hydroxylase positive, and that's the enzyme that produces dopamine. And dopamine, you know, uh, goes down in Parkinson's. So it prevents the loss of the TH positive neurons and ameliorates the loss of uh, DOPAC, which is a dopamine metabolite. 
And then in further synucleinopathy mouse models, rapamycin improves motor function, reduces the accumulation of those abnormal central nervous system proteins, and uh, fixes the injury to the brain. And tree halos in Parkinson's mouse models, just oral tree halos, most of which is getting, most of which is getting converted to glucose. Uh, it attenuates problems with motor function, um, neurodegeneration of the parts of the brain that make dopamine, and the accumulation of alpha synuclein, which is again the abnormal protein from Parkinson's. And they show that in the test tube that even tree halos at very low concentrations disaggregates alpha synuclein protofibrils and fibrils into small aggregates or even random coil structures, which is how it should be and that at high concentrations it slows down the transition into beta sheets and completely prevents formation of mature fibrils. So to translate all of that, this uh, widely available safe sugar, even when consumed orally, when most of it gets metabolized into glucose in mouse, muddies, mouse models is, uh, is very compelling. And they've shown the same thing for Lewy body disease. So it says here, and I'm quoting, in Lewy body disease, which includes Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, insoluble alpha synuclein is widely deposited in the presynaptic terminals as well as in the neuronal cytoplasma in distinct brain regions, and that oral tree halos increase the level of <coughs> autophagosomal protein L. C3, which means that it increased autophagy, which again is a cellular clearance mechanism, and decreased the levels of insoluble alpha synuclein. So it got rid of these bad proteins in the mice. And then in this model of synucleinopathy, they looked at four different uh, autophagy inducers, and they all prevented uh, Parkinson's. So they used a neurotoxin that's known to induce Parkinson's called rhodonone. And they show that rapamycin, lithium, valproic acid, and carbamazepine, which all induce autophagy, protected the neurons and stopped the development of Parkinson's. So, and here the authors are saying that our results suggest that valproic acid and carbamazepine, the most commonly used anti-epilepsy and mood stabilizing medications with low risk and easy administration might be potential therapeutics for Parkinson's. The only reason they didn't include rapamycin and lithium in there is because other study in their conclusions, other studies have already concluded that, and that was part of the discussion initially. So for synucleinopathy and Parkinson's and vitamin D, they've done good-sized studies on this actually, and they've shown, they looked at 3,173 men and women aged 50 to 79 without Parkinson's and followed them, and showed that low vitamin D was a risk for developing Parkinson's. And that vitamin D, in another study, vitamin D deficiency was associated with Parkinson's and vitamin D supplements, as well as working outside, which makes, you know, you make your own vitamin D in the sunshine, was associated with a reduced risk of Parkinson's. But then they did uh, a study that was well designed where they took a randomized controlled trial of vitamin D at a low dose for 12 months, and there are actually beneficial effects to subgroups of Parkinson's patients. That's opposed to the high-dose, short-term study with Alzheimer's, where it may not have been designed so, so well. So the next slide talks about uh, the TDP43 ALS and frontotemporal lobe dementia models. And we look at a few different animal models. Look at first zebrafish, which I know sounds crazy to look at zebrafish, but you know we share 80% of the genes with zebrafish, and they do these things all the time. And uh, they show the rapamycin is beneficial, that it clears out the TDP43 and helps the zebrafish with Alzheimer's do better. And then they did a TDP43 um, model for fruit flies, same thing, rapamycin was helpful and it helped the fruit flies with ALS. Um, they looked at a nerve uh, culture model for ALS and showed that autophagy in general enhances the uh, TDP43 turnover and survival of the nerve cells. And in a frontotemporal lobe dementia model, which uses TDP43 as the accumulated protein, 
they showed four different autophagy inducers were beneficial to both cognitive function and motor dysfunction. And they showed rapamycin and tamoxifen was beneficial, and those are mTOR-dependent autophagy inducers, and spermidine and carbamazepine uh, were effective, and those are mTOR-independent. And they said, I'm quoting the authors here, their conclusions, administration of these four chemical drugs to six-month-old transgenic mice for one month effectively ameliorates the motor dysfunction. And then they did a study of ALS patients with lithium, and they had 44 patients where they gave them either lithium plus riluzole versus riluzole by itself. Riluzole is the only drug that they use for ALS, and it works like this much, unfortunately. And they found that the patients that took lithium, they all were alive after 15 months follow-up. And that disease progression was markedly reduced compared with the, uh, the control patients who were treated just with riluzole by itself. So, and they also at that time, they did a parallel study where they looked at mice with the superoxide dismutase mutation for ALS, which is the first mouse model for ALS. So PD TDP43 has taken the place of superoxide dismutase for these um, ALS mouse models. And I'll tell you why in a second. But they looked at this older model, because uh, this study was from 2008, and they showed a marked neuroprotection associated with a marked increase in autophagy. So again, really revving up autophagy is allowing uh, the clearance of abnormal proteins and uh, protection of the nerves. The problem with Riluzole is that um, it may actually impair autophagy. And on this uh, slide, I present three uh, studies showing that Riluzole does do that. So we have to wonder, what is the full effect of lithium when it's used in conjunction with Riluzole? So others have followed up on that initial very promising results of the lithium study, and they did follow-up studies to it, and they didn't show any benefits. There were no safety concerns to the lithium, but they didn't show that it helped. And uh, in all those cases, it was used as an add-on to treatment with riluzole and not just lithium by itself to compare to riluzole. So there are people who are just calling, they wrote, started writing articles saying like, when is enough is enough? When are we going to get off this lithium kick for ALS? And then the very next year after those studies were written, they came out with this study showing that they had taken uh, the spinal fluid from ALS patients and showed that it was toxic to the motor cortex nerve cells. And if you included memantine, minocycline, or lithium, any of those three agents, it became neuroprotective and then it didn't damage the motor cortex neurons. But when you added riluzole to the mix, it stopped those chemicals from protecting the motor cor uh, cortex neurons. And the riluzole was... Um, antagonistic of any protective effect in the test tube. So the author's conclusions here are the inclusion of a group of patients free of riluzole treatment may be mandatory in future clinical trials performed in ALS patients with novel neuroprotective compounds. But thus far I haven't seen any, any studies with lithium on its own. They did do a study, however, with lithium and valproic acid, valproate, and they showed that when you do that uh, co-treatment, it significantly increased survival. And the p-value there was p, what was a 0 0.016. And they show that the biochemical markers of inflammation normalized um, with treatment. And I'm quoting, it says, this treatment also exerted neuroprotection in our patients because all three markers, they're referring to the inflammatory markers, reached levels that were not statistically, were not significantly different from the matched samples of healthy donors. And that was a study, like I said, of lithium and valproate together. Unfortunately, there was a high dose study, and in that study, after some uh, a year and a half or so, the participants got a lot of side effects from the lithium, and uh, you know, it's not a completely benign drug. So, and this slide talks about the superoxide dismutase mutation with the ALS mouse model. And it turns out that 1.5 to 2% of ALS patients have this mutation, superoxide dismutase. And in the mouse model that has a, that has a superoxide dismutase, rapamycin actually makes the disease worse. So mTOR-dependent autophagy may be dangerous to people 
who uh, have the superoxide dismutase mutation. They also showed, and to back my theory up, they also showed in a separate study that uh, caloric restriction in the mouse model of a superoxide dismutase mutation also makes the ALS worse in the mice. And whereas tree halos, again, with the SOD mutation in the mouse model of ALS, uh, improves the disease. So it's not that autophagy is the culprit, it's here the mechanism, whether it's mTOR-driven autophagy or mTOR-independent autophagy. Say, why? I mean, these are complicated questions, but I think the answer lies in the fact that with mTOR, there's an oxidative signal, that's part of it, and people with a superoxide dismutation, or I should say people, I should say animals with a superoxide dismutase mutation can't handle the extra oxidative stress Remember I said autophagy, if the cell is too far gone, yes, it mostly is a survival enhancement technique, but if it's too far gone, it'll push the cell into cell death. And I think that's how it's making the, uh, these worse. In this slide, it's not um, really germane to uh, the other diseases that we're talking about, but I include a slide on uh, muscular dystrophy mouse model with rapamycin, because here it's just a purely genetic thing, and they show that rapamycin had a bit of effects, you know, it decreased mTOR activity in the diaphragm and had no effect on some of the other muscles. But I wanted, then I included a next study done a few years later that they showed rapamycin loaded nanoparticles improved skeletal muscle strength and cardiac contractility, whereas regular rapamycin failed. So I always have an interest in improved uh, delivery methods like liposomes, things like this. and. Um, I know that tree halos, it comes to mind, is not absorbed uh, from the GI tract very well, but that could very easily be made liposomally by any compounding pharmacy. So this is a study of normal age-related cognitive decline in mice, and they showed that the mice treated with rapamycin since the age of two months on had improved learning and memory as compared to the mice who were not. They showed in this study that the mice that got rapamycin once they developed normal age-dependent cognitive decline did not reverse their cognitive deficits. But in the next study, it's almost very reminiscent of the Alzheimer's studies with, with rapamycin, where one shows that it's good to prevent it, but once it's there, it won't reverse it, and the next one shows that it reverses it. But that's what makes a ball game. Everybody's different results. But in this next study, it says that rapamycin improved cognition in young adult mice, and block the normal cognitive decline even if started 18 months, and that's old for a mouse. Um, and they did make a note that rapamycin-treated mice had less uh, anxiety and depression at all ages studied. And so rapamycin is a, a very important drug for a lot of reasons, but it is uh, the uh, lifespan and health span extension in mice that is uh, made this study in 2009, one of the 10 most interesting studies voted on some list of that year. And it turns out in the genetically heterogeneous mice, rapamycin extended li lifespan, 9% in males and 14% in females, even when treatment was started later in life. So they gave these mice, who were the equivalent of about 65 years old in human years, rapamycin at a low dose, so roughly 12% of the dose that's used for immunosuppression, and it made them live much healthier, longer lives. And when they looked at the dynamics of what it did do, it just improved uh, multiple age-related conditions in old mice, such as cardiac uh, dysfunction, tendon stiffening, cognitive decline, and decreased mobility. And they found that this life-extending property was age-dependent, that at three times the initial dose that was studied, the genetically heterogeneous mice lived even longer. So it got up to 23% longer in the males and 26% longer in the females. And you say, why do the women keep longer, living longer than the females, <laughs> longer than the guys? It's just the, uh, they think the blood levels of the females are higher, and that was the reason, just how it's metabolized. But... Um, and in this study, they showed that there actually are uh, some similarities, but some very key differences between how rapamycin works and how caloric restriction works um, to extend life and health span. And even though uh, rapamycin is approved here as an immunosuppressant, 
remember I said before, it does the opposite of what does a low dose versus high dose. At these low doses, it's not an immune suppressant. It's not that it fails to be an immune suppressant. It actually restores immune function back to normal healthy levels. So rapamycin, when it's given in these lower doses, it doesn't just make the, li the, the mice live longer. It gives them better responses to influenza vaccination. And then they actually did a human study on this with Everolimus, which is a cousin to rapamycin. And they showed that elderly humans treated with low-dose Everolimus had restored immune function as measured by better responses to flu vaccines. And then in this kind of summary article from 2013, it says rapamycin and rapalogs, which again, are those drugs derived from rapamycin, I'll just quote it. It says, it has recently become clear that rapamycin and other rapalogs for which a long time have been viewed and used in the clinic as pure immunosuppressants can mediate robust immunostimulatory functions. But we have to remember that at high doses, they are immune suppressants and that they are, uh, even though they're approved for, um, you know, cancer, even everolimus and terimserolimus, if the dose is high enough, it will suppress the immune system. So here I list one, two, three, uh, looks like seven studies just showing that rapamycin prevents and reduces cancers in multiple studies of genetically cancer-prone mice, and it very effectively prevents the occurrence of cancers. Um, so it led uh, a group of authors to say, well, is it really an age, uh, an anti-aging effect, or is it just an anti-cancer effect? So this is a study that was written by 40 authors, and they, they evaluated aging traits in young and old mice. And they said that rapamycin improved pretty much all aging traits, but it did so in young mice as well as old mice. Therefore, because it improved the aging traits in young mice, we're not going to believe that it's an anti-aging kind of intervention. And the authors concluded that the lifespan extension was from cancer prevention because it remarkably reduced the amount of cancers in the mice. The problem with this is several fold. Number one, their version of young mice translated, translated to 46 years old in human years. And I don't feel the same way I felt when I was 21. And I think that uh, that's one error. And the other is that to say that um, it's just from a, uh, a reduction of cancers, it's true. Cancer is a common cause of death in mice, but rapamycin extends the life of yeast and fruit flies, neither of which die from cancer. So uh, this study was written by 40 people. It was a very uh, power, powerful study, very data rich, and I just think they just missed the mark. But, but you know what, even if they're right, if they're correct, which I don't believe they are, but if they are, and if there's a pill that effectively prevents cancer, hello, sign me up. I mean, maybe I'll do something for baldness. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, tetracycline, they evaluate it with, within aging uh, domains as well. They show that minocycline extends the life of fruit flies and that doxycycline extends the life of earthworms, which doesn't sound like they'd be related in any way to us, but that very same metabolic change that made the earthworms live longer, they say is evolutionarily, it's, it's conserved in humans. We have the same basic enzyme system. So go figure. I had read a study in baby rabbits a long time ago, the tetracycline throughout the life of the rabbit had, uh, was associated with a, an unknown reason. They didn't, couldn't figure out why the rabbits live so much longer with tetracycline. I cannot find that study, it's bothering me. Um, what about vitamin D in aging? They show that with uh, earthworms, that exposure to vitamin D increased the uh, lifespan by 39%. P-value was 0 0.001. They showed in mice that same U-shaped curve, too much or too little vitamin D, they experienced premature aging. Um, premature aging and type 2 diabetes are all on the same axis, just so you know. In mutant mice with too much vitamin D that experience premature aging, when they knock out the vitamin D, it also knocks out the premature aging features. So you gotta stick to that 53 as a magic number. For tree halos and aging, they showed that uh, treatment with tree halos and earthworms extended the mean lifespan by over 30% with no side effects. 
and that even when they started tree halos when the er earthworms were really old, it um, extended their remaining lifespan by 60%. So lithium and aging, I always like studies that have large groups of people, like epidemiology studies. And in this one, I'm just going to quote here, I think it's a Japanese study. They said, in humans, we find here an inverse correlation between drinking water lithium concentrations and all-cause mortality in 18 neighboring Japanese municipalities with a total of 1.2 mil plus million people. And a very low p-value, 0.003. And basically, lithium in the water, low levels, were associated with increased uh, lifespan and decreases in all-cause mortality. And uh, they did a parallel study where they um, exposed earthworms again. They frequently use earthworms because they don't live very long. And believe it or not, they have so many shared mechanisms to humans. And they said here, I'm quoting, consistently we find that exposure to comparably low concentrations of lithium, chloride, extends lifespan of these earthworms. And so my summary of conclusions is that mTOR, this mammalian target of rapamycin, these enzyme systems are central to aging and therefore age-related conditions. The neurodegenerative diseases in particular are uh, a set of illnesses. When you go to the neurologist, they basically give you no, no, nothing, no hope. I mean, I'm not saying to give false hope. I'm, I'm never accused of being an optimist. But my mom says, well, there's life, there's hope, and uh, they keep trying. And uh, it's true, the neurologists will give Aricept and Numenda and these types of things and antipsychotics and whatnot, but there's nothing that they can give to interfere with the, um, the process. Nothing that makes a change in the natural course of the illness. I don't know that anything that we talked about will or won't. It is my hope, though, I give this talk for both altruistic and selfish reasons. And I, I hope that, uh, that this talk winds up and is viewed by somebody that has the interest and capacity to further this uh, and start some additional research into the field. But it seems clear from a number of studies that inhibition of mTOR may slow or halt these processes and that induction of autophagy, both mTOR dependent and independent, may be beneficial but there may be specific risks if infections like Bartonella, Coxiella, Brucella, and we don't know what happens with Lyme because they haven't done any studies. Um, we don't know if it will be risky to induce autophagy in this subset of patients. Certainly in the absence of antibiotics, it sounds riskier than with antibiotics. For all we know, inducing autophagy in combination with antibiotics will help clear the infection. We just don't know because no one's doing the research. So more human research is needed, and that concludes my talk. Thank you.